Coming up, I want to talk about uh, race and crime and how academics and the media have repeatedly distorted the data on race and crime to promote a false narrative that blacks are unjustly prosecuted by the justice system. Debbie joins me for the Friday Roundup. Actually, after a while, we're going to talk about the politics of abortion and the strange case of two parents who were found guilty of manslaughter because of, of a mass shooting perpetrated by their son. If you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. America needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. You've probably heard, well, more than once, uh, I've certainly heard many times, that the U.S. justice system, in particular the criminal justice system, is systematically biased against uh, minorities, and specifically blacks. And uh, this is something that we hear constantly in the media, and it's also something that we hear from academics, from scholars. And often when we read a media report, it purports to look at a study, and the study is showing some identifiable bias. The bias could be in the number of blacks who are arrested, or the number of blacks who are uh, sentenced or the severity of the sentence or the likelihood of getting parole or um, the likelihood of being disciplined when you're in uh, prison. So various ways of trying to expose and document this supposed bias. Now, recently, uh, two prominent scholars, Christopher Ferguson and Sven Smith, decided to do what is called a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is not a study, not a new study, but a consolidation, an attempt to look at a large number of studies on a topic that have already been done. And what you're doing is you're comparing the results of these studies. You're uh, comparing and contrasting them to see what is the overall conclusion, not of just this study or that, but of these studies taken together. So it's kind of a way of eliminating the eccentricity of this particular study or that one. It could be that there are certain factors that you never anticipated or didn't know that caused a result over here, some other factors that caused a result over there. So the advantage of looking at 10, 20, 50 studies is that presumably these other artificial elements can be can be um, removed, can be um, can be controlled for, can be sorted out, removed from the picture, so that you can see clean the thing that you're trying to see. Now, what these two scholars, Ferguson and Smith, do is they look at 20 years of academic literature on the simple question of are minorities and specifically blacks mistreated by the criminal justice system. They look at 50 different studies uh, going all the way back to tw 2005, so two decades of studies. A and the authors say they find two remarkable things. First, uh, this is probably their main conclusion, there is really no clear or identifiable bias against blacks in the criminal justice system. Some studies show a slight difference but some studies, some other studies show a slight difference the other way. And the net effect of these studies is to show that there's, there really doesn't seem to be any, any bias at all. Now, the second conclusion, which is perhaps the one that is, is, um, that takes you, um, that focuses your attention, is that scholars do studies, and even when the study themselves, when the studies themselves, don't show bias. The scholar writes up the article that accompanies the study as if there is bias. So in other words, the bias is with the scholar. Uh, and what we're hearing from this meta-analysis 
is that it is quite normal for academics. Obviously, these are academics of an inferior type, the Claudine gaze of this world. What they're doing apparently is massaging these studies, twisting them, uh, finding small differences that are statistically insignificant and magnifying those. It's very easy, by the way, to do this. The way you do it is you, you violate the core principle of a study. The core principle of a study is to state in advance what is the criteria by which you're going to determine that something is biased or not. So, for example, let's say you're, you say, I'm going to study whether or not there is injustice in sentencing in the criminal justice system, let's say between blacks and whites. So you want to say, I'm looking for a difference that is larger than 20%, or I'm looking for a difference that's larger than 15%. Uh, because if there's a difference of 0.05%, there could be all kinds of factors that have caused this minuscule difference, uh, and it's not a meaningful difference. It's not a statistically significant difference. So if the study doesn't say in advance, what it's looking for, because by saying what it's looking for, it sets itself up like, okay, if we're over 15%, then it's going to be biased, and I'm going to have to try to explain where that bias is coming from. But if it's less than 15%, it's probably other factors. And what these studies do routinely, according to Ferguson and according to his uh, co-author Smith, is the that these studies by typically left-wing scholars they don't set forward their criteria in advance. So what they do is they try to then twist the data to fit the systematic racism narrative. And not only do they distort their own studies, they will, they will sometimes notice a study that shows no bias and they will not even mention that the study exists. So they won't say, hey, I found this, I found some systematic bias, but by the way, there are a number of other studies that show, that show, show the opposite. They will pretend like those studies don't exist, uh, and they will act like systematic bias is has been consistently found across the board, even though the studies themselves don't show it at all. So the, 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 the take home here from these scholars is that we have been getting false information, misinformation for two decades about crime and race. Uh, again, this is a function of having ideologically motivated scholars. Who's the typical scholar who says, you know what, I'm going to investigate whether our criminal justice system is biased against blacks. Usually it's someone who's very sure it is. And they're like, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to prove that it is. And then you look at the data and maybe privately you're like, oh man, this data doesn't really show much bias. But guess what? If I look harder or if I look at some smaller numbers and make a bigger deal of them than, I, than people normally would, then maybe I can show that, the, you know, here it is. Here's the bias that we've been looking for. And maybe there's more of it if we look hard enough. So this is a game in which the conclusion comes first and then you look for data. And then if the data is, quote, disappointing, you start fiddling with the data. In some cases, manipulating it and just outright changing it, and that's just academic fraud. But even if you don't engage in fraud, you can often claim that the data says something that it doesn't really say. Why? Because the ordinary person never checks. Let's say you read an article in Bloomberg or you read an article in the Washington Post, there's a study that shows that uh, there is a significant bias against blacks in criminal justice. Do you say, oh, guess what? I'm reading this article. I'm now going to ask for the original study. And not only the study, I'm not, uh, not just going to read the conclusion of the scholar because that conclusion could have been massaged. I'm going to look at the tables of underlying data to see if the scholar's summary of that data is accurate. Almost nobody does this. Um, and let's say that there are scholars who do it who are of the same mindset as the other scholar. So you have a left winger who looks at the table and goes, oh man, I don't really see this supported in the data. But on the other hand, this is a fellow left winger. They're, they're ultimately supporting our systematic racism narrative. I'm not really going to call out a colleague or somebody who's on my side of the aisle uh, and say, you have been massaging and misrepresenting the data. So I guess what I'm saying here is that clearly there is a 
endemic or entrenched academic corruption going on. And academic corruption that is in league with or aided and abetted by media corruption. And it takes a couple of intrepid scholars to go back and say, all right, let's put all the studies together and take another look almost like looking at this data in, in the form of a cold case, and then suddenly you realize, wait a minute, all the stuff that we've been hearing for two decades about race and crime and about how the criminal justice system is systematically biased is not borne out in the very studies that are done by the left-wing scholars who are trying to prove the bias. Even using their studies and their data, we do not arrive at their conclusion. Guys, the hardest part about weight loss, getting started. There's no better time than right now to call our friends at PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. You'll be glad you did. Start your journey to a healthier you. As I hear from many of you about how PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition has changed your lives, I know each of us has our own reasons for starting. I started because I was feeling a little sluggish, tired all the time. Debbie tried everything else and nothing would work, so we needed some help. I heard from one listener, went for his yearly physical, he's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, diabetes. The medicine made him sick, so he decided to do PhD instead. He has completely reversed his diagnosis. Debbie talked to a lady who, just like her, couldn't get the menopause weight to go away, and Dr. Ashley and her team helped her lose the weight and keep it off. The best thing about this program, they have an 85% success rate of their clients maintaining their weight loss for life. They provide elevated maintenance support for you through the PhD alumni community. The PhD alumni community will provide you with the support you need to keep this weight off forever. So call PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. It's 864-644-1900 to get started. The number again, 864-644-1900, or you can go online at myphdweightloss.com. Remember as a kid, I certainly do, my parents and grandparents making me eat all the vegetables on my plate or when they would say to me and probably to you, eat fruit instead of sweets. Now, this is because our parents and grandparents knew what was good for us and it's truer today than ever before. We need to eat our fruits and veggies. Now, there's no substitute for a healthy diet, but there is this balance of nature, fruits and veggies in a capsule, really easy to take. The products are gluten-free, they're non-GMO, they contain no added sugars or synthetics, so if you're looking for something to make you feel better naturally, you should definitely try Balance of Nature today. Eat your fruits and veggies every single day with Balance of Nature. I started taking Balance of Nature the day I decided I was ready to feel better. So, you ready to start? Whether you order online or call them direct, you gotta use promo code AMERICA to get the special offer. 35% off. Here's the number to call, 800-246-8751. Again, it's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com. When you use discount code AMERICA, you'll get the special offer, 35% off. Guys, after um, not doing our Friday roundup for, what, several weeks now, uh, Debbie is back and back in the saddle and uh, honey, you've had you've been through quite a bit in the past uh, three weeks, I guess. Probably the last, I would say the last month, uh, because well, three weeks ago, yeah, uh, Wednesday of this week, um, we put mom in hospice care, and uh, I was really, I, I was torn. I I went through just. I actually started the grieving process before anything happened. I mean, I was I was just so, so upset about mom, you know, about the thought of mom not being here anymore that it it really it was it was overwhelming. I mean, but you I, just didn't feel uh, able to come on because there were oh, some times yeah. when you were yep. here because yep. you've also been quite a bit uh, yeah, visiting been, your mom in yes. the Rio Grande Valley. Yeah, I've been going back and forth every week. But yeah. yes. But I couldn't do it. I, I just said, I told you, I said, if I sit there and talk about mom, I'm going to start crying. So I can't do it. But um, but I have to say this woman, <laughs> she is very, let's just say she's she's a strong woman. Let me well, put it, you know what? I'll tell, leave it at tell that. Tell people though about how yep. when she was born, this yep. is a kind of an amazing yep. episode when your mom was, was, well, first of all, your mom is one of many children. Yeah, she's one of nine children. Yeah. Uh, and, and 
seven surviving children. Two two passed away when they were children, but but my mom was born premature, and and I have to preface that with saying that my my grandparents were all very tall people, and all of my aunts and uncles are very very tall people. My mom is itty bitty. I'm itty bitty too, but she was very small. But everyone always said it was because she was a preemie. I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, back, she was born in 36. And my grandmother thought she was she was dead. So they put her in a little shoe box and they covered her up with a little blanket. I and mean, they had her at home. They had her, yeah, she had all her children at home. And anyway, they, they covered her up with a little blanket. And my, my grandmother's sister, my mom's aunt, Elena, who my mom is named after Elena, saw that my mom was breathing. She she's looked at the at the little blanket and it was moving and she was like, "Wait a minute, she's alive." So she she grabbed her and I think she spanked her and she gave her a little breath and all of that. All that to say is my mom was surely alive. And anyway, back to to this hospice business. Well, you know, before before you so, before yeah. you go back to hospice, I was thinking and and we were we were <laughs> commenting on it. Just think about it. If for whatever reason your mom had not been revived, right? Yes. In that fateful moment, you would not exist. I would not. So, I know. It is. so if you if you think about it in, in that light, that mm -hmm. was a fortuitous event, not just for her life, but for yours. For mine and my children. And not to mention, and my yeah, children, exactly. Justin and Juliana. Juliana, right. Yeah. So anyway, very, very interesting and, and beautiful and miraculous and all of that. But but all that to say is, you know, when, when you went down to Harlingen with me, when mom was in the hospital and was being released to hospice care, we thought she was going to pass away. And because she had all the signs, you know, they gave us this little booklet that said, you know, these are all of the signs when your loved one is passing. This is this this is like three months before. This is two two weeks before. This all of those things, all of the I steps. Mean, a fascinating document in its own right. Yes, uh, yes. Because it outlines the stages of detaching from the world, which apparently the person knows and right. so they begin this process of withdrawing from the world then they inhabit two worlds mm -hmm. so it's almost like they're undertaking a uh, a psychological and mm -hmm. spiritual journey yeah it's it's amazing. really quite amazing but anyway all that to say <laughs> is that mom instead of getting worse mom is getting better <laughs> she is actually and getting in fact, better she's isn't she kind of yes. quizzically well, why am i in hospice yes, she like, wants to know why she's in hospice she wants to know when she can fly on an airplane and and there is actually in that booklet they talk about how sometimes loved ones will regain their strength and they will eat their their a great meal and they will talk to everybody but that usually is only one day not Two weeks. <laughs> oh, right. In so, fact, in fact, I think the the reason that they put it in the booklet is they want to pr um, not give relatives false false hope. hope correct. So they're they kind of say, listen, if you if there appears to be a recovery, if the dying person uh, wants to uh, eat a full breakfast, you know, give it to them. Yes. But but don't be lulled into the idea that they're they're making a comeback. Yes. It's in fact a stage. Right. Right. Of the deterioration itself. Exactly. Uh, so, sort of so a as one. You, but in this case, yeah. your mom has been consistently yeah. eating a baked potato. And oh yeah, she's she's been eating. She is. They were having to crush everything, all the pills that she had to take, her antibiotics, all that. That they had to crush them. They no longer have to crush them. She can swallow the pills whole now. Uh, she. When I talk to her on the phone, in fact, I'm going, you know, going again to see her. When 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 we talk on the phone, I can hear her. She was whispering for a long time. I couldn't hear her at all. Right. She wasn't making a whole lot of sense. Now she's kind of back to her old self again, and she loves company. So if anyone knows my mom, go visit <laughs> her because she absolutely loves company and and gets upset if people don't go see her. So <laughs> this I thought is it was my quite mom. comical. Your uncle <laughs> descended on her and yes. and then finally decides that he's going to go home and rejoin yeah. his wife. And your mom's like, why is he leaving? Why is he leaving? <laughs> she can't understand it. Anyway, my mom is, is so funny. And then she, and even she asked, wants to know why I can't why, do the podcast yeah, she, from. Exactly. She's like, well, why? 
why why do you have to go back and I said because we have to do the podcast well why do you have to do it from there can't you do it from here right <laughs> so anyway but um so it everything's great I, i'm i'm very happy i will take however long we have left with her and and just really cherish well, I, I do think uh just watching you in the process and it it's been interesting for me because as you know with both my parents my dad my mom they were far away while these things were happening. So my dad died in 2000, my mom in 2019, mm -hmm. and but I wasn't present. But you are very much present and on the scene and watching you go through kind of the the agony of it, yeah. the grieving of it, but also uh, you you came to a point of a certain piece about life and death, which is, I think very good. Yeah. Um, well, you you have to know that that it is very different from the death, uh, my father's death, because right. his was a sudden death. He and was. You were seventeen. I was only seventeen. He was forty seven, and and he died of a heart attack. I mean, he was here one day, gone the next. So I will take this over that any day because that is like a shock to the system that you just cannot, you cannot recover from. It is extremely difficult. It took me probably. 10 years really to recover from that um the the grieving of the, of that so i will take this any day compared well, to that i think it's but it's partly because at 17 you're still dependent on your parents right yeah. you're, you're you're off to college you you need your parental support mm -hmm. and second this was an untimely death in the case of your dad your mom's 88 so your and your mom has lived a really not only a, only a full but a, a fulfilling. And she's not done yet. <laughs> and she's not done yet. Exactly. She's still got. So, yeah, I'm yeah. just waiting for her to say, "Well, I'm ready to play piano at the church." I know. Yeah, she might and do I, that, that. That could be. That yeah, could be around the, be around next. the bend. But um, but um, anyway, um, we've um, um, we've laid this out a little more than I had intended. We yeah. want to talk about the uh, the pro life issue. Uh, which is not unconnected with all this. Uh, but why don't we take a pause and let's do it in the next segment. You might have heard Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way they used to. They've been part of this horrible cancel culture. So they want to pass the savings di directly on to you by having a $25 extravaganza. So wait till you hear about this one. When Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company, just the pillow. But with the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some of which you may not even know about. So time to check it out. To get the word out, I want to invite my list to investigate their $25 extravaganza, two-pack multi-use my pillows, just $25. My pillow sandals, just $25. Six-pack towel sets, $25. Brand new four-pack dish towels, you guessed it, $25. And for the first time ever, the premium my pillows with the all-new Giza fabric, just $25. By the way, orders over $75 will get free shipping too. The amazing offer won't last long, so take advantage of it. Go to MyPillow.com and use promo code Dinesh, or you can call 800-876-0227. Again, it's 800-876-0227. And don't forget the promo code. It's D-I-N-E-S-H, Dinesh. There's a very common sense reason gold is pushing to all-time highs right now. Actually, there are several reasons. One, inflation. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed. Since January 2021, cost of living is up 17.9%. Not good. The national debt continues to skyrocket, now over $34 trillion. That's even worse, causing many people to worry, when is this house of cards going to come crashing down? Then we're in a presidential election year. Very turbulent, massive implications for the future of the country. So all of this is adding up to instability, uncertainty, and that's why so many Americans are turning to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? You should secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold like Debbie and I have. Text Dinesh to 989898. You'll get a free information kit. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, tens of thousands of happy customers. You can count on Birch Gold. Just text Dinesh to 989898. Get your free information kit and begin to protect your savings from uncertainty today. 
I want to um, ask Debbie about her take on the the abortion issue because Trump has been hailed as the kind of a champion of the pro-life movement. Reagan was pro-life, but Reagan wasn't able to do a whole lot for pro-life. Of course, Roe versus Wade was the law of the land, and there simply weren't the, there was no way to get around it. With Trump, you got three new justices, you got the overturning of Roe versus Wade, so the Dobbs decision. So the pro-life movement, looking at Trump, this guy has delivered more than any other president. And it's not even close. And yet, some of the pro-life leaders, Marjorie Dannenfelser, Lila Rose, they seem to be unnerved by Trump's recent statement. I'm going to let abortion be decided at the state level. I'm not going to push for a federal law. We, we had a goal. Uh, and the goal was let people in the states decide what they want to do about this issue. I've achieved that goal. And so what is your take about this? Because there clearly is a clash between principle on the one hand, which is abortion is always wrong. And, and the legal strictures that are placed on abortion, which the American people seem to be seem to believe that it might be okay to restrict abortion under certain circumstances, but I don't think that there are that many states where a complete ban on abortion would be what the people would go for. Right. And I've always said that as long as people do not think that abortion is actual murder, that will never change. It will never change because as long as people think that abortion is a woman's right to choose or that, you know, a fetus isn't really a baby, you, it's not really viable. So, you know, it's, it's yeah, you could, you could end it. As long as people think that, then we will never win this debate ever. So we have to win the debate. And again, does anyone now present day think that slavery is, it's okay. It's okay for, for the South, maybe not for the North, but you know what, if the South wants it, they can have it. Does anyone truly believe that today? So I believe that it is very similar, similar to the slave issue back then, right? You, you can't go full abolitionist because you're never going to win it. You're not going to win that debate. And Lincoln debate. understood that. He understood it. And I think Trump understands the, the abortion debate as well, the same, in, the, in very similar terms. Yeah, I think that's right. Trump, Trump, I think, thinks that the Democrats are hoping that the secret bullet of abortion will solve all their problems on the border with illegals, with a horrible economy, with foreign policy disasters, one on top of the other. Biden thinks... All of that can be can be put to the side by getting people riled up on this one issue. And so Trump's view is, listen, I've delivered on this issue. It's not like I've done nothing and I'm asking the pro-life movement to just bear with me through the election. No, Trump is saying, I the thing that you wanted and that you have wanted for four decades, I have delivered. Mm -hmm. You have it. Mm -hmm. So now you have a task ahead of you. And I think this is really where I think the pro-life movement should not drop the ball. And that is there is a lot of work to be done, particularly in the red states, right. places like Kansas, Nebraska, Ohio. If you're losing referendums in those states, then there's a problem. Then you have not made the case, like right. you said. Yeah. Because if people are ambiguous about this, like, I don't know when life begins, then they're going to say, well, let the woman decide. I mean, look at this Arizona issue by, by the by the Arizona Supreme, Supreme Court, Court yeah. right? Everybody's freaking out about it. Everyone, even the even the conservatives who run on abortion are like, yeah, that's a little that's going a little too far. Well, it really isn't going too far. However, convincing the people that that is the right thing to do right now today 
is ju- it's just not going to happen. And it hasn't been done. And it has not been done. It has not the 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 case has not been proven. Now, why do you think that is? Because it seems to me like in 1973 it was a little harder to do. In fact, if I go back to that debate, and I'm familiar with the debate from the late 70s, they would produce prominent physicians. Here's a French doctor. He's going to tell you about the various stages of this conception, and then there's, this is when the heart develops. And so you uh, you had to resort to a certain medical terminology, but now with the ultrasound, Mm -hmm you can actually see for yourself that what is in the womb is a living, breathing, Mm -hmm. genetically distinct, having its own organs and features, human being. So the pro-life movement has been has been given a tech through technology, a visual demonstration, a gift, really. a gift. Yeah. Where, and and yeah. so why you can't make the case yeah. is a mystery, right? Well, it's not really a mystery, honey. It's not because think about it. When academia, Hollywood, and the media all side with the abortionists, that is pop culture. That is the norm. That is what people think of as the norm. And as long as they continue to say that it's woman's health care and that it's woman's right and this and that, of course, they don't care about women when it comes to trans, but this in this instance, they do, right? Um, I think that it's very hard to counter that narrative. They They win the narrative because they have all of those people backing it. I mean, you raised an interesting counterfactual, which was, what if the media and academia and Hollywood were on the other side? What if they were drumming home into the minds of all Americans, this is a horror that is going on in our society. There is a systematic killing of infants Mm -hmm. that is going on and has been going on for 30 years. And how can we claim to be a decent country when this kind of thing is happening? And how can you claim to be a decent person while you're doing it or are okay with it? You're saying that we would have a very different debate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it would be something that even, you know, like the TikTokers would be talking about, like, you can't kill a baby. And, and, and it would be like, I don't want to say propaganda, but if they did that, it would change everyone's mind on it. And I mean, everyone, everyone's mind would be changed because of it. You know, my mind was changed when I had a miscarriage. That was when I realized, you know what, this is a baby. And and it's not that I didn't, that I wasn't pro-life before, because I always said I would never have one. However, I always said, but I'm not going to tell so-and-so what to do. And I'm not going to go and stand by by Planned Parenthood and and like block the entrance. I'm not doing that. Th- that's because I really didn't understand what, what we're debating. I didn't really understand life and when it began. But now that I do, I see the point of doing that. However, that being said, if you want to convince the voters of your state, even if it's a red state, that this is wrong and it should be stopped at all levels, uh, except the life of the mother, um, then you have to change everyone's mind as I mean, to think what about, it is. You know the case we were talking about um, several days ago about the woman who left her kid while she went to Puerto Rico. Yes. And the child it, died, yes. right? Now, that was a very young child completely neglected, Mm -hmm. neglected unto death, Mm -hmm. and the woman got life in prison. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was sort of no issue there. Obviously, someone who is, who takes an act, who is so negligent, almost deliberately negligent, because obviously an infant can't care for itself, so the child was essentially left to die. Yeah, it's very sad. Very, very sad. But but your point is, if people thought of the unborn, the fetus, that way, debate over. There would be outrage. There would be outrage because 98% of, or maybe even more than that, of abortions are done because it's inconvenient. I don't want to have a baby. I can't afford a baby. I can't, you know. Not the right time. The I've right already time. got two. I don't want exactly. three. Exactly. So, so they make it about themselves and they don't make it about that unborn Which was basically baby. this woman's motive. She wanted to go to Puerto Rico. Yep. She had probably Selfish. no way to take the kid. So she goes, guess what? I'll just leave the kid. I'll just go because all I'm thinking about is myself. Yep. So say, you're saying it's the same mentality. It is the same mentality. And as long as people still believe that, we are never, and I mean never, going to win the debate. 
Let me ask so, you about something else, and we can discuss this more briefly, and that is the very interesting case of the parents. Mm-hmm. Now I'm talking about the the, the kid, uh, the young um, guy Michigan? who did the mass shooting in Michigan. His parents were convicted of manslaughter. Now I'm not sure I'm okay with this because although, of course, we all raise our children to be uh, in our image and do the things that we want them to do, it doesn't always work, right? <laughs> Children are their own person. They become adults. They go their own way. So it doesn't make any sense to me that when you have grown kids who have committed crimes that you somehow can hold the parents liable. I mean, do you feel the same? Um, yeah, because I think, as I told you before, I think it's a Pandora's box it, that you open. And and just because the judge thinks that this parent was negligent in in you know his up in raising, in raising his kid okay well you know what where does it stop like okay well this this serial killer okay his parents were really bad so so they're going to be responsible for all of the killings that he did and okay his cousin actually showed him a video of how to do it so there his cousin's going to jail i mean it just it, it's not going to stop so i think this is a very slippery slope that this judge is is has done i mean i wonder if there was just a, such a feeling of out now look i suppose one could uh, conjure up in the mind an extreme circumstance in which the parents have somehow actively abetted the depravity of the son so let's say for example the the son is psycho Mm -hmm. you know and the parents know this guy could easily kill somebody but guess what birthday present it's a gun right Right. then then you're you're actively enabling Mm -hmm. the act Mm -hmm. as opposed to this is a kid that doesn't live with you doesn't care what you think they're not they're they're on their own you have no control over them regrettably that's that's the plight of many parents yeah Uh, yeah and again you know you need to be involved in your in your kid's life you need to know what they're doing at all times you you need to especially when they're teenagers really because they can get into all sorts of trouble and they can mix with the wrong crowd and all those things. So yes, you should be, but 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 that stops short of saying yes. But these people need to go to jail for fifteen years each. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, we haven't followed uh, in detail the facts of the case, mm-hmm. but I think what we're trying to do is blow the whistle on the fact that that. A criminal justice system is about the accountability of the guy who did it. Right. And not the parental failure of the parents who should have prevented it. I mean, think of all the parents that should be in jail now if that was the case. I mean, think about it. Would you or I (laughs) lock up Jeffrey Dahmer's parents? They they may not have been the best parents. What's Ted Bundy's parents? I mean, we could go on and on and on, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, You know, even. So it's it's a decision which may or may not be right on its own, but it, it. it what opens about up all the Al Qaeda terrorist parents? <laughs> Might be worth going and finding them. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> For Abraham Lincoln, as I mentioned last time, the Declaration of Independence is absolutely central. And Lincoln appeals to the Declaration of Independence to confirm, to point to. Not to establish, but to indicate the full humanity of the uh, the black man. Obviously, the black man in those days called the Negro, uh, and today that kind of phraseology is completely out. But it is the phraseology that comes down to us through history, and so it's not entirely uh, avoidable. Here's Lincoln. Uh, He says that the Democrats in the South want to be able to take their Negroes, to take their slaves into Nebraska, just as they take their hogs into Nebraska. And um, then says Lincoln, he says, now I admit this is perfectly logical, if there is no difference between hogs and Negroes. So here's Lincoln. Uh, making the point about natural right in a very clear way. That is, human beings are equal to each other, equal in being human. They're not equal to other animals. And there is a kind of natural hierarchy between humans and other animals. It is not a violation of rights for a man to ride a horse. But it is a violation of rights for a man, metaphorically speaking, to ride 
over another man uh, or to ride another man in the sense of controlling that person and manipulating them and stealing their, their labor. Lincoln gives a very telling example. He says that the Congress that uh, was present at the founding outlawed the African slave trade and attached very severe penalties to people who trafficked, who continued to traffic in human beings from Africa. So the African importation of slaves was stopped, stopped after a certain date. Now, says Lincoln, why would the founders attach all these harsh penalties uh, to slave trading with Africa if basically slaves were like animals and could be traded? Why would you say, for example, oh, no, you cannot engage in the cattle trade? And in fact, not only are there severe penalties, we will put you to death if you engage in trading cattle. Lincoln goes, that makes absolutely no sense uh, because trading in cattle is not wrong, but trading in human beings is wrong. And so Lincoln uses this example and an example from the era of the founding itself to show the founders knew that blacks were human beings. The founders knew that there was something morally wrong with slavery. And, um, and now, Lincoln is constantly confronted with people who attack him on the grounds that blacks are in a continent that is undeveloped. Uh, blacks are living in a country where uh, there is not a whole lot of inventions, not a whole lot of progress, the standard of living is very backward, and this leads to the idea that maybe blacks don't know how to run their own country, blacks are not ready for self-government, uh, blacks are not as intelligent as whites, uh, blacks are lacking in all kinds of civilized qualities that whites supposedly have. Lincoln was, by the way, very skeptical that all of this was true in a sort of absolute sense. In other words, it's true in a conditional sense. You can be in a country that's backward and there could be all kinds of reasons that the country is backward. So Lincoln doesn't deny that some countries are more backward than others. But I don't think Lincoln um, ever seriously thought that blacks were intellectually inferior to, for example, whites, but this is not ground that Lincoln wanted to fight on. Lincoln didn't wanna be arguing about who's more intelligent, blacks or whites. To Lincoln, that was really not the issue. And Lincoln, in a, in a beautiful way, would sidestep those kinds of issues. People would say to Lincoln, do you support inter intermarriage between the races? And Lincoln would say, um, no, the fact that I don't want a black woman to be a slave doesn't, want I mean her to, doesn't mean I want her to be my wife. So Lincoln here appears to be yielding to a certain type of public prejudice. And I would argue he is. Uh, in a democratic society, leaders cannot ignore the prejudices even of their followers. You have to take them into account. Uh, here's Lincoln. This is from the Springfield speech of July 17, 1858. I'm quoting Lincoln. Certainly the Negro is not our equal in color, perhaps not in many other respects. Still, in the right to put into his mouth the bread that his own hands have earned, he is the equal of every other man, white or black. In pointing out that more has been given to you, you cannot be justified in taking away the little which has been given to him. In Lincoln's own poignant phrase, if God hath given him little, that little let him enjoy. Now, uh, let's notice very carefully what Lincoln is doing here. I'm going to go through this word by word. Certainly, the, the Negro is not our equal. Now, here Lincoln appears to be giving in to the prejudice of the crowd. By the way, most people in the North, most Republicans, thought that la blacks were intellectually inferior to whites. This was a widespread sentiment in the country, Republican and Democrat, North and South. Lincoln knows this. He appears to be agreeing with it, but the key word here is appears. Certainly the Negro is not our equal in color. Now that's a very uh, almost comical phrase. It's, it's like me saying, well, certainly you're not my equal in height. 
Well, height doesn't really matter. Uh, if I'm 5'9 and you're 5'6 or you're 5'11, you're, you're, you're not my equal in height, but that's not an important category. So certainly the, the Negro is not our equal in color. And then comes this phrase, perhaps not in many other respects. So Lincoln is willing to concede, but only as a possibility that maybe the Negro, maybe the black man is not equal in other ways too. Maybe he's less intelligent, but the key word is maybe. Lincoln is not saying he is, and he's not saying he isn't. He goes, well, maybe, perhaps. Uh, but then comes his punchline, whether he is or not, the guy has a right to keep what he's earned. So if, it, if what he's earned is less, he has the right to keep that less. Now, let's come back to the Declaration of Independence. Um, because for, in Lincoln's view, the founders recognized the full humanity of blacks. And the founders also realized that it would be right to give them the right to keep the fruits of their own labor. In other words, it is slavery is wrong. But the founders also realized we have it. We've had it for 150 years. We don't know how to get rid of it overnight. We certainly cannot have a union without it. So we're going to keep it, but we're going to put it, as we think, on a path to dissolution or extinction. So in, to put it somewhat differently, the founders said, we believe that all men are created equal and have certain rights, but we are not in a position now to give all men those rights. In fact, we are only in a position now to give some men, or perhaps more accurately, most men, their rights, but we're not in a position to, to give all men their rights. And so what we are going to do is take the something that we can get instead of the nothing that we will get if we try to get everything. That's the key to understanding the, the founding. Uh, to quote Jaffa, if the government had attempted to secure in their fullness the natural rights of all Americans, not to mention all men everywhere in the world, the experiment of such a government would have met disaster before it had been fairly attempted. But the inability of the founders then and there to secure the rights of all men whom they believe possessed unalienable rights did not in the least mean that they believed that they that the only people possessed of such rights were those to whom the rights were to be immediately secured we're going to give rights to some people to most people but not to all people but that's not because we believe that only these people deserve the rights and those people over there don't they actually deserve them too we are simply not in a position of power to be able to give them those rights. If we try to do that, we our whole experiment is going to collapse. And now I'm going to read a sentence uh, which I'm going to come back to uh, next time. I think the authors of that noble instrument intended to include all men, but they did not intend to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. It goes on to say, They did not mean to assert the obvious untruth that all men were enjoying that equality, nor yet that they were able to confer it immediately upon them. In fact, they had no power to confer such a boon. They meant simply to declare the right so that the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. So when I come back the beginning of next week, I'm going to uh, examine closely uh, this passage from Lincoln. I think one of the most important passages in the entire Lincoln corpus because it so beautifully summarizes Lincoln's full understanding of the Declaration of Independence and of the great divide in America that ultimately led to the Civil War. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.